like you to, to introduce you or, 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 uh, or wel welcome you to uh, our first session of the day, uh, which is entitled Strategies for Managing Shrinking Resource Revenues. Um, we are um, very, very pleased to be um, uh, in the presence of three extremely distinguished panelists uh, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, but what I'd like to do before that is, uh, is introduce the format of this morning's session, which is going to be a little bit different, no, very, very different than what you're, you're used to and that what we've done in the other panels. Um, so if you'll notice, you each have a slip of paper on your chair. What that slip of paper is for is a controversial statement related to the topic. And just to remind, uh, remind you of what the topic is this morning, um, what we're talking about is whether countries were well prepared or poorly prepared going into the commodity price crash, why they were well prepared, and what are the ways that countries can be better prepared in the future um, if they're resource dependent or resource rich and you have a commodity price crash. And to sort of you know, uh, stimulate your thinking a little bit, we've, we've placed a discussion paper on your chair. So what we're going to do is we'll start in the normal way. Uh, our three panelists will, uh, will give opening statements. And again, I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, and then after, um, what we're going to do is pick it, uh, not at random, because I'm going to bet them, uh, but we're going to pick um, the, uh, the pieces of paper out of a, out of a bowl uh, with a controversial statement on it. And each panelist will be given two minutes to respond to that controversial statement. So one will start and the others will be able to respond. Uh, and that way we'll, we'll get a little, you know, juices flowing for the, um, uh, for the Q&A session. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, uh, is write on that piece of paper these, these statements. So, and just to give you examples uh, of different statements, um, every country should save a portion of oil, gas, or mineral revenues for future generations. Another example might be transparency and accountability is just a fad. Or this is the conference's best panel. And, each, and the panelists will have to respond to, the, to, the, uh, to what you write down. So write it down. We're going to have uh, David is, has volunteered to go around and pick up the, the, um, the pieces of paper, and we'll put them into a bowl. And while the uh, panelists are making their introductory remarks, I'll, I'll vet some of them. So, so allow me to uh, start by introducing these three extremely distinguished panelists. Um, let me start. Well, let me start with uh, Dr. Zoyfak. Dr. Uh, Zoyfak is a uh, practice manager in the global practice at the uh, for macroeconomics and fiscal management at the World Bank. Uh, he's taught uh, economics and applied econometrics at the University of Clermont-Ferrand. Um, and full disclosure, he's also on NRGI's uh, advisory council. Let me thank him for that. <laughs> um, Sitting next to Dr. Zoyfak is Dr. Baumia. Uh, Dr. Baumia is well known to uh, anybody who's worked in Ghana. Uh, he served as deputy governor of the Central Bank of Ghana between 2006 and 2009. Um, he was also the vice presidential candidate for the opposition New Patriotic Party uh, for the 2016 presidential election and is a visiting professor of economic governance at Ghana's Central, Central uh, University. And last but certainly not least, uh, on my extreme, on, on your right, my left, uh, the Honorable uh, uh, Mr. Amar Jargal. Mr. Amar Jargal uh, has served, uh, he, he's ha had 16 years in Parliament, which uh, is I think the most I've ever, <laughs> among uh, all the parliamentarians I've seen uh, or I've, I've met, I think is, is very impressive. Um, 16 years in Parliament and has served uh, as uh, several uh, seats in, in, within the executive, including Minister of External Relations and, uh, and as Prime Minister of Mongolia. So uh, please welcome all of our panelists. And uh, uh, for those who have entered, uh, well, you, you no longer get to play the game.
<laughs> All right, so, so uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, maybe what we can do is we can start um, yeah, with uh, Dr. Zoyfuck and move, and uh, each of the three panels will give opening remarks on this, on this subject. <coughs> Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, good morning. Okay. Look, when, <laughs> when I was asked to speak at this session, um, I look at the portfolio of countries that I work on at the World Bank. And that portfolio includes countries in East Africa and the Great Lakes. So I look at the top two of the countries that are the most resource dependent, and uh, in my portfolio, these are South Sudan and the Republic of Congo. So I wanted to talk about South Sudan, but I thought it would be too boring, right? You know what's happening in South Sudan, definitely. You know, three years after the uh, independence, the country broke into a civil war and the collapse in oil prices has completely um, you know, turned the country into a, uh, uh, a vast experience field in, in, in management of natural resources. So I thought that would actually not be interesting. I, wanted to, I want to talk about one country which generally goes under the radar screen, it's the Republic of Congo. It's not as popular as the other Congo. Most of the time we hear about DRC. But I want to talk to you about the Republic of Congo. The Republic of Congo is a middle-income country in Central Africa. It's uh, more than $3,000 per capita economy. It's a tiny uh, country with like less than 5 million people. But it's also one of the largest uh, exporter of oil per capita in, in, in Africa. And if you, uh, you have seen uh, uh, the, the, the chart shown yesterday uh, uh, on, on resource dependence, the Republic of Congo was actually quite high up there in, 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 in the chart uh, presented by Kid Myers. Now, the Republic of Congo is, uh, you know, it, it's extremely oil dependent in the sense that more than 65% of GDP is, is oil, 85% of government revenues come from oil, and more than 90% of exports are oil. So um, when I think of the Republic of Congo, it reminds me of this uh, interesting story I once heard. And the story takes place in the um, uh, Soviet Union. So one journalist once asked Leonid Brichnev, comrade, Brichnev, if you were to describe the state of the Soviet economy in one word, what would it be? And Brichnev said, good. Obviously, it wasn't. So the journalist was really puzzled and said, comrade, in two words, what will it be? And he said, not good. <laughs> well, this is the story of the Republic of Congo because it's good. It looked good until the crisis hit, and then we started actually realizing that it wasn't good. First, why, and, and, and that's how I'm structuring my, 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 my points here. First, actually it looked good on paper. It looked good because the country did what we thought was the right thing to do. The country are now saving close to 80% of its GDP in 2013. 80% of its GDP. So we all thought that was great. And there is a mechanism in the CFA zone where countries can actually save some of their external reserves in, in, in the central bank. And they did announce that they were saving accordingly. Second, the country did set up a fiscal rule on paper and decided that above 1,500 billion CFA, which is roughly uh, 2.5 billion USD, 
70% of the revenue would be uh, invested and 30% would be used for current expenditure, especially social expenditure. So everything sounded quite, quite right. Then the country also told us they were saving even more than what we thought and some of the savings was in China because most of the infrastructure being constructed is actually constructed by Chinese companies. So uh, the um, savings part was there. And the third important fact is that the government basically was investing since 2010. And they have actually increased the rate of uh, investment to uh, extraordinary level of more than 50% of GDP, which is, you know, kind of mind-boggling. But, um, you know, I'll come back to what that, that actually includes. So the country was investing, the country was saving, debt is low, inflation is low. They were clearly on paper doing exactly the right thing. So um, why is that not good? When the price of oil collapsed, then we thought the government would be doing a clear counter-cyclical policy by drawing down on the reserves to sustain public investment and domestic demand. But instead, what happened was a uh, rather uh, puzzling behavior by the government in the sense that you know, the government immediately started cutting expenditure. The government actually uh, announced that only 30% of internal debt would be paid. Basically, you know, all the bills of private firms servicing government would only be attended up to 30%. The saving parts, actually, when you look at it, and we started actually asking questions, well, at the central bank, it wasn't the 1,500 uh, billion, but it's actually less than half a billion that is saved at the central bank. And information on the savings done in China is actually not available. The consequence of this uh, you know, uh, behavior is basically uh, that the economy that was growing at 6.4% last year is projected to actually contract and, and our projection suggests that we'll probably have a one, minus 1% 1 GDP growth in 2015. The country was running a surplus of 5% of GDP, and it's certainly going to uh, run a deficit in 2015. Um, the, the, the country, um, you know, non-oil, uh, non-oil economy is, is, is also contracting severely. And our estimate is, is, is that, um, you know, this, the, the non-oil economy that grew by roughly 8% in 2014 would only grow by 2% in 2015. So one interesting uh, fact here, and if I was, you know, I think, I think if, if that journalist had asked Brijnev to, to describe the situation in three words, I think it, it would have been uh, can do better. And can do better for uh, the Republic of Congo is, is, is where I'm actually trying to draw the, uh, the lessons of what, what has happened uh, uh, recently. The country has actually not been saving as we thought. So the first lesson that I, um, I, I want to draw from this episode is, is basically that um, having fiscal rules on paper is one thing. Implementing them is actually the key. And we need to probably invest a little bit more into the political economy of fiscal rules. Why is it that it's so difficult for countries to implement even the simplest fiscal rules? It's got to do with the political economy 
uh, and, and I think we need to uh, do a little bit more work in understanding how to make those rules work. The second uh, you know, lesson I'm drawing from this episode is that savings can be a very elusive concept. It's not enough to say a country has been accumulating reserves or the country has been savings or saving you know, with, with the boom. It's not enough. It's important to actually get to the details of what that means. These savings of the Republic of Congo in China is actually meant to be funding the infrastructure of Chinese, you know, funding Chinese companies who are investing in infrastructure in the Republic of Congo. So the question is, then, where is the other public investment going? Because in fact, when you look at public investment, it's more than 20, 25% of GDP over the past two, three years. If most of the infrastructure actually, actually using the reserves saved in China, then what is the public investment, the regular public investment budget financing? It's a question, and, and it's, not, it's not that obvious. So we need to get a little bit into the details of what saving means, where is it, in which currency, and we need to be able to design and help country uh, design the type of revenue management frameworks that are extremely uh, detailed and, and clear. For example, there is no rule in the Republic of Congo as to what happens in case of uh, uh, price uh, collapse. What are the you know, revenue allocation rules we know what are the mechanisms through which that savings you know, is used in a properly defined counter-cyclical policy, right? You know, in what ways should the government actually use those savings? And, and who does it? It's all a mystery, right? So again, we are in this context where we praise countries for savings, but actually, the question is, is it actually savings? And where is it? Actually, you know, we're still not, not very, very sure. The third re lesson I'm drawing here is the resource finance infrastructure. Uh, you know, uh, resource finance infrastructure is an area where I haven't heard these things yesterday in this conference, but we need to be looking at it a little bit more closely. Most countries these days in Africa are not saving and then investing later or saving and investing they are basically transferring resources into you know, third parties who would build that infrastructure. So basically, they're not investing themselves. They're you know, transferring resources to third party to invest for the countries. The question is, you know, you know, what are the terms of these contracts? You know, what is the efficiency of this investment? It's frankly a kind of black box for now, and we need probably to look a little bit more uh, into these into this, uh, issues. Um, fourth lesson, I think the, the, the investing is important, but, but the quality of investment. Just like in the past we used to say level of in expenditure and then the quality of expenditure, we need to get into that discussion a little bit more when countries are apparently doing the right thing, which is investing these resources you know, for the benefit of future generations. In what exactly are the countries investing in? You know, what are the, you know, optimal choices that have to be made in the investment uh, decision? What are the, uh, you know, what, what are the sectors or what are the areas in which those investments are the most uh, uh, productive for future generations are all questions that we haven't been able to answer for this country of Republic of Congo, and I'm sure for many others. So, uh, and, 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 you know, the last point is, well, I think transparency and accountability still matter. Um, one of the things that has really been uh, shocking to me, looking at this example, is uh, how little we knew before the oil price collapse, 
and, and how little we still know. Yet, when you read about these countries, especially a country like the Republic of Congo, the general opinion is they're doing the right thing. They are saving a lot. They are actually doing, they are, you know, they have fiscal rules, so we should have expected them to do better, yet they haven't. So uh, I think these are the uh, couple of uh, lessons I, 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 I drew from this uh, episode. And uh, the last point is basically uh, the government has now approached us and, and, and others to start designing a proper sovereign wealth fund, which is funny because you know this should have been done way before. But, but given what I just told you, actually getting you know, into a framework where you can actually discuss the rules for savings, the rules for uh, uh, disbursing those revenues would be already a step, a step forward. But, but what content or what mandate should that sovereign wealth fund uh, have is, is a different uh, discussion. Should that be uh, you know, a typically in a sovereign wealth fund investing most of these resources abroad or should that actually in some way help in fi financing the infrastructure uh, within the country and, and social sector uh, is, is all uh, under discussion. So I think I've uh, you know, uh, gone through my 10 minutes and I'll stop here and, and, and uh, looking, I'll be looking forward for uh, further discussion during the session. Thank you. Wow, so, wow, there, there are a lot of different issues you raised there, and we'll have a time to explore at the end. Um, sovereign wealth fund, government, whether you know, sovereign wealth funds are appropriate for every country, whether savings and, and debt are two sides of the same coin, and whether you should even be saving if you're, you're indebting yourself. L lots, lots of issues. I'm going to invite Dr. Uh, Baumia uh, to follow up um, with uh, the Ghanaian case. Need some technical assistance. Yeah, yeah, slide. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Well, um, um, listening to the Congo story, um, there are some similarities as I as I listened with with the Ghana story, and we heard a little bit about the Ghana story yesterday. Uh, Ghana discovered oil in two thousand seven. Uh, and this was a major um, period of excitement for, for, for Ghanaians. There was euphoria and the expectations were very high uh, about how it was going to dramatically uh, change the fortunes of, of Ghana and, and bring prosperity and so on. Uh, I think um, Ghana had been searching for oil for, for several decades and I think uh, there was a general feeling that we had hit uh, the jackpot. But with the experience of countries such as Nigeria uh, to have in mind, there was a sense that Ghana should do everything possible to avoid what our brothers had experienced in Nigeria with, with oil. And so there was um, a whole lot of work that was done uh, conferences held, visits to other countries to try to put together, you know, a revenue management framework uh, and, and a, a, a policy framework generally that would avoid the oil case. Um, this resulted in the Petroleum Revenue Management Act in two, 2011. Now, as the elections drew closer in 2012, however, uh, all the things that Ghana had tried or made good noises about avoiding uh, began 
uh, to, to appear in earnest. Um, the last quarter of 2012 in particular saw a major expansion of government expenditure as the elections drew closer. Uh, and so you saw a situation where after really producing oil in 2011 where the deficit was about 4% of GDP, the last quarter of 2012 in particular saw this major expansion with a deficit ending close to 12% of GDP in 2012. And, and since then you see the, the, the public finances have had difficulty in recovering um, and have been virtually at double digits over the last three years. In addition to this, um, there's been a major increase in debt. Um, and, and you would all recall that Ghana was one of the countries that benefited from HIPIC relief to the tune of some four billion dollars. Uh, but the rate of accumulation of debt since the discovery of oil has been phenomenal. And, and you've seen debt increasing um, at the rate of about 116% every year over the last six years. 116%, more than doubling of the debt every year. So you, you've seen an increase in debt uh, from about 9.5 billion Ghana CDs to today standing about 88 billion CDs. Um, between 2008 and 2014, 2015 March. So this ballooning of debt, you, you just see the before and after pictures um, um, for, for um, uh, prior to oil and after oil, uh, major increase in debt. Now, when you look at the debt stock, actually, you, you'd see a debt stock today standing at about 88 billion Ghana. Ghana cities. In dollar terms, that would give you about $22 billion. But that does not actually tell you the quantum that has been borrowed. Because if you take the depreciation of the exchange rate into account, which is depreciated by over 50% in the last 18 months alone, uh, then you would see that the proper way of looking at the quantum that has been borrowed is to see what has actually been borrowed every year, looking at the exchange value of, of that borrowing. And when you do that, you would see that over the last six years, the government has borrowed some $34 billion. Now, you've borrowed $34 billion and, and you've earned an oil revenue of only $3 billion in, in the process. And this high debt accumulation has placed a huge burden uh, of interest rates as far as the fiscal is concerned. It has really taken out critical fiscal space. And the debt service alone in 2015 is equivalent to the total debt stock at the end of 2008. Just the interest payment in 2015 alone. Uh, and this has really been burdensome for the economy. And one of the key takeaways take I, I hope you would remember is that Ghana's interest on debt this year is six times Ghana's oil revenue. Six times Ghana's oil revenue is just to be used to service the debt that has been accumulated. So pretty much the oil discovery has been compromised. And, 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 and you know, uh, the resources have been mortgaged. And, and Ghana is now officially classified as a country at high risk of debt distress. Only a few years ago, we had HIPIC relief. Now, what is most disconcerting is, is that the whole debt accumulation process was done uh, with the government totally ignoring advice. Um, the president currently, when he was vice president, um, when this issue was raised by, by many observers uh, that the country was accumulating debt at such a high rate, uh, made the point that the government has got ca more capacity to borrow. Uh, and so there was this sense that oil um, would save the day. Um, just last year on the eve of, of, of the IMF bailout, uh, when I raised the major issue that this debt was becoming unsustainable, uh, the president has made, uh, surprisingly responded to me and said, I will borrow more, you know. <laughs> yeah, so this, this, this is, but then what was all this money used for? Um, and what is surprising, when you look at the capital expenditure, one would really expect 
that you, with all this borrowing, all these resources, uh, I mean, and, and so on from oil and all of that, you would expect to see that this investment in capital expenditure would be increasing. Uh, at the very least. But what you look at the, the, the capital expenditure as a percentage of GDP for Ghana since 2008, we've gone down from 9.1% to 4.8%. And, and, and this is not consistent with what you should expect to see uh, with this, this sort of accumulation of, of, of resources in, in the form of loans and so on. Uh, so there's really a, a major question. Um, obviously, um, what has the money been used for? Uh, and, and it's definitely not being used for uh, capital expenditure. It's more for, um, for consumption expenditure. And to the extent that the, the capital expenditure did take place from the oil resources, it tended to substitute rather than add to, to what was existing. Uh, and, and, and the revenue management framework that was put in place uh, doesn't seem to have worked well because uh, the minister seems to to, to have some arbitrary um, powers under the Act to cap the amount that goes into the stabilization fund. Uh, revenue forecasting has been, um, been uh, more on the optimistic side. And the Public Interest Accountability Committee that really was set up under the framework to, to have oversight over the management of our oil resources has deliberately been starved of cash. And so their ability to operate has been quite compromised as well. Um, in this context uh, of, 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 of this um, macro outcome, um, exchange reserves have declined dramatic, net international reserves have declined dramatically. Uh, the exchange rate has depreciated and continues to depreciate on a daily basis as we speak. Growth has seen a major decline from the 15% level that we had in 2011 when oil was uh, pr uh, started to be produced to some 3 to 3.5% that is projected for this year. The government finds itself very cash trapped. It is in difficulty to meet statutory payments, pay difficulties in paying salaries, and difficulties in servicing debt. Very recently, that is a, just last week, one the trade minister suddenly was beginning to offer companies contracts in exchange for helping government settle its debt. And this is really mind-boggling. There's a loss of policy credibility underlying all of this, and this really ushered in the, the, the IMF bailout in, in, uh, oh, in um, April of, of this year. We, we, we now have an IMF program to try to get Ghana out of this. Now, what could Ghana have done differently I, I, I think that we could have managed expectations better. I think there was too much euphoria about what, what Ghana, the oil discovery. Um, definitely prudence and fiscal discipline were thrown out of the window and we could have done a little bit better uh, if there was a commitment to it. And, and it was very important, which we have not done, to reach a political consensus across the divide on the management of the oil resources. Um, limiting the central bank financing of government and, and, and all of that. But I think it would have been also very good if, as Ghanaians, we focused more on, on, on trying to borrow good ideas, workable ideas from what has worked elsewhere and, and really implement them rather than this appetite to borrow money, which has consumed us and we are now paying very dearly for it. So at the end of the day, when the oil price collapse happened, Ghana was very ill-prepared. Uh, Ghana was very ill-prepared to deal with it. And, and we now face a very tough situation over the next few years um, under, the, under the fund program. Difficult decisions uh, will have to be made uh, to bring Ghana uh, back to where it was. But fundamentally, the oil discovery has been compromised. And, and effectively, the oil has been mortgaged um, for, for, the, for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. It feels a little strange to clap after such a sobering story, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but th thank you, uh, Dr. Baumia. The, uh, I feel like our, our next speaker, um, unfortunately, might have a similar story, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> to tell. Uh, but I'd like to invite uh, the Honorable uh, Mr. Amar Dragal to 
um, speak for about 10 minutes. Well, good morning to everybody. I don't know how much you know about Mongolia, but two years ago, Mongolia used to be the best performing economy, one of the best performing economies in the world. And Mongolian currency, Tugrik, was one of the best performing currency in the world. And the Mongolia was the most attractive place for investment. And uh, the project, we call it OT and TT. One is a copper mine, the other one is copper coal mine. These two projects was the most fashionable projects of the century. And uh, simply saying Mongolia was a really success story. Success story. Everybody was interested in Mongolia. What do we have now? Well, economic growth down to four to five percent. It used to be double digit number economic growth. So now it's down to single digit. Five percent is still very good, but comparing with sec uh, double digit numbers, it's uh, quite unsatisfactory. Foreign direct investment also down seven times. Exchange rate up, import down, international reserves also down. So we face very difficult macroeconomic situation. So what's went wrong? Well, first of all, commodities, price, super cycle, has gone yesterday, somebody mentioned about it. And the mining revenues, of course, went down to a certain uh, articles of the budget. It's down by three times, 50% and so on. So we repeated all classical mistakes which we were able to do. It's related to the pro-cyclical policy. When we had the money, we spent a lot. Child money, we provided to every child a lot of money. We provided citizens money to every citizen of Mongolia. We're getting cash every year. Uh, we provided students money and so on and so on. Also, in terms of the territory, it's a huge territory, very big. And uh, you have to provide government service to every corner of the country where people are living. And this is also take money we need to expend on such kind of services. Uh, when all these commodities prices were up. We put so-called windfall tax, and this windfall tax, frankly speaking, spoiled Mongolia. We were thinking that this is money will be come always, and we can spend wherever and whatever we want to do. In addition to all the things, we had a problems with knowledge, experience, and consistency of economic policy. We had the problems with managing competing priorities. And uh, I, would, I have to say that uh, we tried to our best to a certain extent to manage all these problems. We established Human Development Fund to manage this wealth from mining sector. We developed the idea of uh, building the industrial clusters to certain areas of country. 
and to try to make a diversification of the economy and so on and so on. But all the things, of course, takes time and, frankly speaking, didn't work as we were expecting. But the most of all, as a politician, I will try to give explanation to what happened to the political side of uh, issue. In my understanding, political structure should be able to accommodate economic growth and the structural change of the economy. And in this regard, Mangiola was not able to do it. The political parties didn't fulfill their obligations. They were unable to form strong, credible cabinet, for example. Election system, you know, it's a four-year election cycle, which makes all these politicians and political parties full of promises, make promises, rather than to look forward and long-term In addition to all the things, we had a problem with historical memory. Mongolia was a socialist country, and social spending during these 70 years of socialist period was huge. And several generations of people were attached to so-called free education system, free health service, free other government services. And people were demanding such a kind of services and government because of this political populism and so on and so on should respond and to give uh, to provide money to such kind of things. Also problems related to the corruption didn't went around Mongolia. We went through problems related to the corruption, emergence of very strong interest groups, I think also playing very negative role. Last but not least one I have to mention about the play of great powers. Everybody interested in Mongolia's mining sector, everybody wanted to be part of this sector. America, Russia, China, Japan, all want to be there and all pushing their interest on mining sectors. And in my understanding, this is the uh, main reasons why we failed to fulfill expectations. Uh, but despite all these problems, I am quite optimistic about Mongolia. We didn't reach the level of Ghana, and we didn't reach the level of Nigeria, and so on. So we maybe just at the beginning of this commodity-related activities, and if we will follow right path, maybe we can avoid problems with other countries experience it. But if we will do wrong choice, I think we will follow exactly the path of other countries. I am optimistic because Mongolia has a very high level of education. And you know, during the socialist period, and uh, still we putting a lot of money to the education system, one of the highest level of literacy in the world, 98%, 99% of literacy. And if you look to the ratio in secondary education, university education, vocational training education, the ratio of girls to children, unique. We have a problem with sending our boys to school rather than girls. Out of 10 persons who have a vocational and university education, seven are women. That's a quite impressive number. In terms of health service, we also have a very good network of health service. 
and we spend a lot of money on these sectors, but uh, we didn't get, frankly speaking, the economic output, economic growth world which we were expecting to get. And that's why it was certain, uh, I would say, switch to the policy, try to handle economic growth based on mining sector. And we just entered to this stage and uh, I think uh, we will uh, learn a lot of from our friends in other countries. In terms of uh, general estimation of the mining sector, just recently World Bank published a paper and according to these World Bank numbers, the Mongolia's mining wealth around one to three trillion USA dollars. So it's a huge number for, for Mongolia. I mentioned about the TT, it's a cotton coal project, and this is a 6.4 billion tons. We're talking about 5% of Chinese market. So it's a huge, huge reserve. We're talking about the copper mining, OT, Oyu Tolra, which is actually, again, 5% of the world copper market. There's only one mining. It's a huge, huge project, and we still are discussing this project with our investors and trying to get a very good deal. In terms of oil, Mongolia have also very big reserves, proven uh, geolo geological estimation up about to the level of Norway and Oman. So it's again huge potential. In terms of uranium, we're talking about one-fifth of the world proven reserves. So mining sector will play a very important role in Mongolia's economy and in my understanding, economic growth based on mining sector uh, will be quite challenging area for Mongolia and Maybe in five years from now we will sit and discuss uh, what we have achieved in this area. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Omar Drago. The, uh, <laughs> I'm struck that these are the three stories we're hearing are three stories in some ways very similar um, uh, countries that were perhaps over exuberant about the size of windfalls and, and spent a lot of money and then realized, wait a second, the money isn't quite coming yet. Uh, let's, uh, um, and, and then when oil prices or, or in this case copper prices declined, um, you know, we saw either an increase in debt or, um, and maybe eventually spending cuts. So, so what I'd like to do now is, uh, so thank, thank you for those who, provided um, uh, controversial statements. Uh, so what we're going to do now is, is something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to read out one of the statements that some people came up with. And what I'm going to ask the panelists to do is that whoever I point to, to just take literally two minutes. So like, you know, no long speeches, just sort of whatever comes to mind. And tell me whether you agree or disagree with the statement and why. So the first statement is uh, macroeconomic stability and fiscal sustainability, uh, sustainability, excuse me, requires more politics and less reliance on technocrats and foreign advisors. More politics, less foreign advisors. Um, Dr. Baumia, can I point to you first? Can I, can I ask you to, do you agree or disagree? Uh, disagree. Um, <laughs> as a technocrat who has sort of been dragged into politics, I think uh, we need a more uh, dispassionate analysis um, of, of the issues and therefore put together the policies. Um, and I think less politics, um, generally in yours to the benefit of, of, of the country more than uh, taking a political view. So I think that uh, the technocrats, I think, should, should, should be more involved in, in policy making. 
in, in our countries. Okay. Um, sh should I give you a second or? <laughs> um, For me? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I think, Albert, you mentioned about, the, you asked about why it's so difficult to implement simple fiscal rules. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the answer. In terms of technological knowledge and techniques and all the decisions, there's so many nice papers and very clever papers and books and everything that are here. But technically, we know what should be done, but the question is why it's not done. Why we cannot simply implement very simple fiscal rules? This is, I think, the most important issue. And in this regard, the political side of the equation and the role of politicians are enormous and their responsibility is very high. Mm, interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Zoyfak? Yes. Um, this is a very interesting question and, and having heard uh, the previous two answers, let me try to uh, you know, uh, give an answer that is somewhere in the middle, right? So, one, um, you know, I once read that the definition of uh, a technocrat, well, actually, technocrat is a nice way to call nasty people. <laughs> and in, in, in ensuring macro fiscal stability, you actually need more nasty people <laughs> than nice people who are politicians. Because the politicians tend to please. What they do is to appeal to you know, the public and try to uh, respond to, uh, uh, to, to whatever the, the public wants them to do, which is what actually, in, you know, uh, which, which is what leads to uh, uh, a political cycle in our public finance most of, in, in most of our developing countries. You just look at the deficit the year prior to the election. We just saw Ghana. The whole story of Ghana, the whole disaster, is elections, is politicians meddling with fiscal policy. It's politicians actually trying to please and raising salaries and give you know, hands out and, 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 and basically um, you know, not looking beyond the political term. So um, um, I, I tend to resist the temptation to say, you know, we need more politics or more politicians into uh, macro and, and, and fiscal uh, arena. Uh, but, but I think we need more understanding of the politics. To my view, that's the most important. Technocrats need to understand better the functioning of the politics to be able to be even more nasty. <laughs> Okay, more, more nastiness. Uh, um, but I think, you know, I'd like to get back to this, and I encourage you, uh, after this, we're, we're going to ask questions. So I encourage you to, to prod some of our panelists on this point about um, mainly, the, you know, a lot of the point that, that uh, the Honorable Mr. Amanjargal raised, which is we have all these nice fiscal rules and all these nice books, and we have some authors of some, you know, uh, important papers on fiscal rules here sitting in this room. But in so many cases, these rules are not complied with, and the question is, is why? Uh, the next question we have, I really like this one, uh, or, it's, or, or statement. Crises are good. They will force governments to be creative in generating and managing the little resource revenues they have. So again, crises are good. They will force governments to be creative in generating and managing the little resource revenues they have. Um, who, uh, do you have any volunteers? No, I Please. Think, uh, <laughs> I should take. <laughs> well, crisis is not so good. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to have a crisis. But eventually it happens. And when it happens, we're simply not ready. And in my understanding, uh, the art of governance, art of managing the micro level economy, is somehow related to trying to predict or to foresee what might happen, what might happen. And if you want to do these things, you have to rely on 
professionals, intellectuals. I mean to Oxford University. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please. Right. Um, I think, you know, uh, I also don't share the view that crisis is uh, necessarily good for you. Um, crisis, to the extent possible, should be prevented. Um, sometimes you may be hit with a crisis that has nothing of your own doing, and then you'll have to manage it. Um, and how you manage it be becomes important. Nonetheless, crisis does provide, uh, a crisis can provide an opportunity for reform. Um, in many countries, um, for example, the oil crisis of the late 70s uh, provided opportunities for reforms, for structural reforms and other reforms. Um, in our recent case in Ghana, for example, we had a crisis in 2000 um, that provided opportunities for reform. Um, we went hippie and, and did a lot of structural reforms. But I think um, we should be managing to avoid crisis. I think we should put in frameworks that allow us to better manage crisis and also to avoid the crisis. And, and uh, so um, the self-inflicted variety of crisis is what really we should, we should be trying to, to avoid. Those are not good at all. I actually tend to agree <laughs> with that statement. Crises are good. <laughs> Crisis are extremely good, and actually we, uh, in this conference, should be celebrating the recent crisis. <laughs> no, no, seriously, because, you know, we, we lamenting, you know, what has happened. It, we should be all discussing what kind of opportunity this collapse in oil price has given us. And in the policymaking area, it has given us a tremendous opportunity. One, for new producers, who were already having trouble managing expectation. And I think the uh, uh, CEO of uh, the, Kenyan Cent the Kenyan National Oil Corporation yesterday on this uh, panel discussed how much of a, 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 you know, a great thing this crisis was for them because they do not need to explain to people that you have to keep expectation lows, low because now you can see exactly what is happening with countries that thought they were going to become rich the next morning. So this is a great opportunity in that sense. The second reason why it's a great opportunity is that this is going to give us a little bit more leverage in working with countries in setting up the type of institutions, including revenue management framework, that can ensure that we don't have this kind of crisis in the future, or institutions that can withstand this type of shock in the future. Because it's a fact of life, being an economist, I know there will be more crises coming up, and I'm just looking for the kind of opportunity the next crisis will be giving me. <laughs> well, it's like yeah. wishing you, 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 <laughs> contract, you have a heart attack simply because you, <laughs> you think you'll live forever. I, I don't think the heart attack is necessarily good for you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I got the impression that uh, World Bank <laughs> and IMF always happy with crisis. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, that, that could lead to conspiracy theories really quickly. Uh, the, um, so we're going to take two more, two more of these, and then we'll open it up to the to the audience. Um, Next one is countries should not borrow when faced with oil price with an oil price crash or copper price crash in this case, but they should cut spending. So again, countries should not borrow when faced with a commodity price crash, but cut spending. Any volunteers? Mm. Uh, again, I should stay here. Yeah. Well, there is no simple answer to these questions. It very much depends on the concrete historical and uh, socioeconomic situation. Some countries need to borrow. Some countries, of course, can wait and avoid trying to borrow. And uh, sometimes you really need uh, to make a very tough choice in terms of expenditure and so on. But it's, it's again, depends what kind of 
problems you're trying to deal and what kind of solutions you want to find. Otherwise, just giving this is a black or white answer, it's wrong. So it's very country-specific, time-specific issue. We shouldn't just rush to judge it in general terms. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I agree generally with that with that sentiment. Um, borrowing uh, in the midst of a crisis um, can, um, if you know, it is seen uh, to be a, a, a temporary situation, you you could probably help, you know, smoothing out that particular shock. But if it is going to um, affect your debt sustainability, uh, then you need to think twice. About, about about borrowing, and I think um, uh, as long as you've been sort of preparing yourself in the good times when you have this type of a shock, you should be able to manage it uh, better, including using your savings and borrowing and so on. Uh, but I think when you are in a, a, a real bad situation, uh, then uh, additional borrowing at that point would not make sense, and you should really focus on the expenditure side. Thank you. Yeah, uh, let me first agree with uh, the first speaker that it depends on where you are on your uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio. If you have a ratio of 20% of debt to, G to, to GDP ratio, and you have started uh, investing in infrastructure, and, and you're, you have started as a country to invest in, uh, in energy, for example, that would unlock the potential for your private sector, and, and, and you have savings. Well, I wouldn't actually say you should not borrow. In fact, you could borrow just a little bit and complement with your saving to make sure you don't cut back on that spending on infrastructure that would be necessary to take you out of the crisis. Most policymakers actually understand that where borrowing is good when, I mean, borrowing is good when is, is, is uh, manageable. Borrowing is actually good because it forces you into a discipline of showing results for what you are spending. So if you can actually borrow a little bit, if you have that space, it could be one way to actually manage those expectations in countries where people believe, you know, you know we, we flush with cash and, and getting uh, that complemented with your savings to make sure you don't cut on necessary spending that would actually uh, allow the country to uh, uh, shorten the duration of the crisis would be useful. So, so I mean, in, in some sense, this is a question of, uh, I mean, this is not just a theoretical question. In reality, how many times do we actually see a country cut when they can borrow? And often, you know, I think what we just end up seeing regardless is is borrowing until you can't borrow anymore. Mm. Um, the last of these is I, maybe my favorite. Um, we need charismatic leaders for macroeconomic stability. <laughs> we need charismatic leaders for macroeconomic stability. Which charismatic leader at the table would like to <laughs> take, take that on first? Mm. Um, you've done such a good job of starting us off. <laughs> we need charismatic leaders. Well, uh, well leaders should be charismatic by definition, <laughs> otherwise nobody follows you. <laughs> so especially in terms of macroeconomic management issue, of course we need a person who knows mm -hmm. and who has very deep knowledge of the uh, subject and uh, the issue of personal integrity and personal commitment also very much important. It's not just uh, simple things, knowing some, but so especially politicians in the developing countries should be very much a committed person to, to, to his country, uh, to the development, to the economy, and this commitment should be reflected on his decision based on the broader national consensus and broader national interest. And in this regard, the, I would say the subjective factor is very important and uh, I think you're right. We need charismatic leaders. Well, of course not. Um, my grandma used to tell me a story about 
uh, 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 someone who met a very good dancer at a dance and decided that that was, that, that lady decided that that was the man she wanted to marry. And then the man took her home after the marriage and any time she was hungry, he would start dancing for her. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> if, you, if you get a charismatic leader who has no vision, <laughs> no, no competence and no integrity, that is all you will be left with as an economy. <laughs> you will only be left with charisma. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, that's a great story. <laughs> and and uh, you know, when I heard the statement, I thought that was uh, clearly the results of the perfect spurious regression. You know, you know charisma and macro stability, frankly, you know, we'll have to do those regressions and find out what you know, it's come. To me, to me, it has no, nothing in common. Uh, and, and, and just for a practical matter, I have in my set of countries, the set of countries I work on, I have what you would call charismatic leaders doing a mess of, of macro stability. And I have democratic governments actually doing pretty well and, and leaders that you may not necessarily qual you know, qualify for, for charismatic doing a very, very good job uh, managing uh, the, macro, uh, the, the, the macro situation. So um, I, think, I think, you know, good leadership in general is, is, is good for the country. Good leadership, uh, you know, uh, but good leadership, to my view, is not necessarily linked with charisma. As, as uh, uh, you know, Honorable, uh, you know, from Mongolia said earlier, you know, it's about having a vision, and, and Mahmoud, you said, so, said that too. It's about having a vision. It's about, um, um, you know, uh, making sure that uh, the country uh, has a, a long-term, uh, uh, you know, vision and, and, and making sure that it's implemented in, in the right, in the, you know, implemented properly. And, and that's, and, 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 and the second thing is, is, is to appoint the right people at the right positions. If you do that, definitely you'll have good results, and that's true also for the macro and, and, and fiscal management. Yeah. So, so you've got nothing to do, from my view, with charisma. Um, thank you, Joel. I mean, you know, these, uh, this discussion makes me think a little bit um, of my own country, where we have um, the least charismatic leader, <laughs> uh, but where we do have a degree of macroeconomic stability. And I guess the question is why, and maybe part of that uh, is sort of a, yeah, it's institutions, it's systems that we've, you know, that's been, that have been put in place that regardless of who's in power, uh, you have some degree of stability. Um, the, uh, I'd like to open this up to, to questions, um, both from the room, but also from the Twitter sphere and, uh, and uh, from people listening to us on the web. Um, I'm going to point to maybe three or four questions. We can maybe take them and, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to the panel. Yes. Uh, also, can we bring the microphones? Thank you. My name is Kwabena Okuaferi. Um, I'm a civil servant who works for the government of Ghana. Um, I just want to react to two things that Dr. Baumia said. He did a very good diagnostics of the issues, but when he tried to put judgment on some of them, that is where I think he went wrong. Um, he says that revenues have been overestimated. I will say that revenues have underperformed because the estimation of the oil revenue is enshrined in the law, and there's a formula that allows us, that tells us what exactly should be done. So if you do that and the, you don't get the revenue, then it means that either the prices went down and that is why you didn't get the revenue and not that the revenues were overestimated. Because the revenue estimates that we had for 2015, for instance, matches perfectly well with what the IMF also did. But they had to be reviewed because of the price fall. The other thing that I don't agree is when he says that the Public Interest and Accountability Committee has been 
deliberately starved of resources. It is not true because the law does not allow year marking of resources. And the diagnosis that he did um, are right. The whole economy is um, facing um, um, uh, revenue shortfalls. And therefore, if you cut the revenue for portions of the economy and it affects PIAC, we should not say that it is a deliberate attempt to starve uh, PIAC. The last one that I want to talk about is that the PRMA, that is the Public Re the, uh, Petroleum Revenue Management Act, is not working well. I disagree because I think that one of the very good things that have happened to Ghana is the passage of the law before the exportation of petroleum. And with that, I think that we try as much as possible to go according to the law. There are some inconsistencies, and that is why the law is being reviewed. So um, I will say that if um, he, Dr. Bawamia has any proposals to make for amendment of the law, he should bring that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just like to ask uh, that people um, stick to questions that, and, and just a, a bit short, just because we're running out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, and then in the back. Yep, my name is Jargal, I'm from Mongolia. A question is, we don't talk about the, uh, the people's participation. The people, the governments are borrowing too much because they are doing in, in the way they, they see. They don't see the monitoring by people. We haven't been talking about this part at all. Good case is our government, they borrow money when they they don't know even for that, for which they are borrowing. And after they decide what for, they will spend it. So that's why I suggest to involve their part, the, the true instrument that we have in democratic societies where people, that's why I suggest this transparency concept is as important accountability as before, as today, as tomorrow, along with this social awareness, social learning we have discussed yesterday, so please reflect on your side. If there is better participation in the monitoring by ordinary people, like a demo, in any normal democratic society, could we, better in, in, could we be in better situation? That's, that's my comment and question, thank you. Thank you. My name is Ishmael Aka. I work with the Africa Center for Energy Policy, Accra, Ghana. I have two questions, one for Dr. Baumia, the other for uh, Honorable from Mongolia. Uh, please, um, the P P Petroleum Revenue Management Act actually provides that 70% of uh, the ABFE, the amount that is allocated to the budget, should be invested in capital. And uh, we saw capital expenditure declining. I don't know why. Recently, the government uh, set up a petrol, um, investment, is that investment law or some committee to do investment with petroleum revenues. Do you think this is actually a solution to the declining in capital expenditure? With Mongolia, uh, Honorable said they are very optimistic because they have high literacy level. When you come to Africa, one of the countries with the highest literacy level is Zimbabwe. And uh, would you say Zimbabwe is successful because they have high literacy level? I believe that probably we should go beyond high literacy level to have investment plans and guys to prevent some of these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to take one more from the Twitter sphere, if I can ask uh, Lee to... Uh, ask the question. Uh, yeah, we have one question from Emma Farge, the Reuters correspondent based in uh, Dakar, and she would like to know, how will African oil states be able to build up sovereign wealth funds now when they're running deficits? Great question. Okay, so, so we have four questions. Um, uh, the first one was directed to, towards uh, uh, Dr. Baumia, so I'm going to leave that to you. The second one was around transparency and citizen monitoring. Um, and, and this is a great question. Can, um, uh, can citizens really monitor macroeconomic management? Is that, you think, is that a realistic approach? 
Um, the third one was, uh, well, for, for both of you about, uh, in, in one case, literacy, and whether literacy is really the, uh, the, the thing that you need in order to develop and the reason for hope, or whether you need more than that. Um, and then the last one was around sovereign wealth funds and whether sovereign wealth funds uh, are, uh, how can you develop a sovereign wealth fund when you have a fiscal deficit, essentially? Um, anybody want to go first? Yes, so let, uh, let me go first. Um, my good friend, the civil servant from the Ministry of Finance, who we have actually worked together uh, in the past uh, quite quite closely. So, uh, but I understand his position. You you really have to defend government as much as you can, <laughs> uh, and, and so I I, I understand that. Uh, b bottom line, the nature of the. Petroleum Revenue Management Act uh, is that you take 70% of the petroleum fund into the annual budget funding amount, which finances the budget, and then 21% goes to stabilization fund and 9% to, to your heritage fund. The nature of the structuring of this you know, means that there is a really an incentive to over forecast revenues. Uh, so that you get a high percentage of that 70%, uh, that 70% into the into the fund. And when you look at the data, in fact, that has been the outcome largely that you have had a tendency to to over forecast revenues. Um, you would say that it's just an underperformance of 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 revenues. Um, but you know that is that that is fine. But that is really the incentive and the moral hazard involved in that particular structure. And we are seeing that actually happen. Uh, on the day, for example, that the budget was presented uh, this year uh, with you know, $99 per barrel as the forecast, that, day, that very day, you know, oil prices were around $50. And so, but for the IMF program, we will probably not have been in a position to revise but the IMF insisted that we, we do revise, and we did revise. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that, um, that that is a situation. The PIAC itself has complained, and I'm sure if you follow what civil society has been saying, uh, that they have been, they have been starved of funds. Yeah, maybe your question is that it may not have been deliberately done, but it, it, for, for the sort of oversight responsibility that they are supposed to play. If you are really serious about implementing the act, you will make sure that they can at least pay their rent, you know, uh, to, to actually be able to, to take to that oversight responsibility. But when they are really starving for funds to even pay rent for their premises to, to undertake the oversight responsibility of you, the government, uh, then there is really a sense that you are deliberately doing this. And they have actually come out and, and made this statement themselves. I'm not just making it. PIAC itself has, has made the statement that they are being deliberately uh, financed. The, the, the Minister of Finance uh, last year arbitrarily capped the stabilization fund at 250 million, even though Section 23 of the Act gives him the right to do so. Why did he choose $250 million to cap at the stabilization fund? He wanted more fiscal space. You know, he could have capped it at a higher level that he brought it down to 250. Uh, it is arbitrary, and it is one of the areas, I hope, uh, that the um, new amendment to the law will, 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 will sort of look at it. Now, there was also a question on the investment uh, in capital uh, as under the Act, uh, Petroleum Revenue Management Act, and why we are seeing a decline in capital expenditure even though. If you look at, at, at the Act, it, it specifies a few areas where investment of, of oil resources should go into roads, agriculture, and so on. Uh, and so if you look at the uh, expenditure allocations out of the petroleum fund, you see it going in, into infrastructure. And this is why I'm saying that the decline in, in the infrastructure or capital expenditure as a percentage of GDP tells you that that expenditure is substituting rather than adding to existing expenditure. Uh, and, and that reduction for any resource uh, dependent economy, you should see 
that capital expenditure should be growing up, going up, but this is really mm. a decline, uh, and, and, and it, is, it is something that is not good for Ghana. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave these uh, here and let my colleagues answer their other questions. Dr. Zafak? Yes. Um, <clears throat> look, my understanding of the Ghanaian experience is, is that um, there has been a great process leading to this revenue management uh, bill. And we shouldn't throw it away just because the politician got in and, and, and created uh, the problems we have seen uh, quite eloquently presented by uh, uh, Dr. Bahumia here. We should not throw out the, the, the baby with the bath water. I think there has been something good achieved in Ghana. And the reason I'm saying this is because if we had, you know, as imperfect as it is, if we had that framework in the Republic of Congo, the situation would have been better managed. Okay? Because there is no such a rule allocating revenues. There is no, uh, you know, mechanism or at least not even... I'm not even asking for a civil society-led process, you know, but, but no clear rules as to how that saving should translate into investment in the Republic of Congo. So having reached that level is something actually good. And, and if we could get to that level in some of our countries, that would be extremely uh, useful. And getting that level of transparency and accountability in the process of setting up revenue management framework it's something that we should all try to get in all other countries. What we should try to avoid is to absolutely make sure we work with countries in years prior to elections to resist expenditure pressures, which are, to my view, the biggest problem we have in fiscal, uh, macro and fiscal management uh, uh, in, in resource-rich countries. The pressure to spend the year prior to, to the election leads systematically to widening fiscal gaps. And if you take a country like Uganda, it's systematic. You know, if you look at the deficit the year prior to the election, it's, 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 you, know, you see that you know, huge spike. And the following years, we have to work to try to bring it down just in time for the next election to spike it up again. So, so, you know, the, the Ghanaian example is something we should really, um, you know, probably uh, uh, you know, approach with that clear, uh, you know, uh, 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 distinction. Now, on, on sovereign welfare, and if I may, you know, uh, try to answer that question, it's actually a very, very good question, and I asked the same question to the government of the Republic of Congo who were asking for help to set up a sovereign welfare when the uh, fiscal balance is uh, going from, uh, you know, 8% last year to minus 1% this year. So is this the time to be setting up sovereign welfare? I think from what we heard from Paul Collier yesterday, it's important not to use SWF as a panacea. It's not a magic, it's not a magic acronym. It's not a panacea. I think what we should be understanding is we need to set up strong revenue management framework and the timing is actually right for countries that don't have them. It's important to set up those frameworks during the crisis to be able to uh, make sure we, we address all the expectations of the population and, and, and manage better in the future. So, I wouldn't call it a sovereign wealth fund, but, but countries like the Republic of Congo do need a properly defined mechanism to save and to invest counter-cyclically. That is something that is needed. Let's call it something else, but, but those institutions need to be created. Great. Thank you. Our, our la thank you very much. Our last comment goes to, uh, or last statement goes to Dr. Uh, to the Honorable Mr. Amar Jargal, um, which, and this is a very relevant question for you because Mongolia right now is in the process of thinking about whether to set up a, a new sovereign wealth fund, and, 
and also thinking about how to monitor macroeconomic management. Uh, so the question around citizen monitoring and uh, sovereign wealth and when to set up a sovereign wealth fund and whether to set up a sovereign wealth fund is fairly relevant. Okay, that question regarding the literacy rate, of course it's a very important issue, but uh, literacy and education issue is a necessary condition for economic development, but not enough. We have to look at other factors, institutional factors, for example, property right issue, rule of law, quality of institutions, and so on and so on. Even within the education sector, we have a lot of issues which should be we should consider is the issue related, for example, level of democracy. When you have a GDP per capita around $300, you have one kind of democracy. When you have $3,000, another kind of democracy. When you have $10,000 per capita GDP, totally different kind of democracy. So it's uh, uh, a lot of factors affecting the issue. The issue related to the transparency, role of media, NGOs, social learning, and all this bunch of factors are really defining the path you're going to go. And in this regard, you have to just uh, try to see all these factors in, in, in all together. Uh, regarding the wealth fund, we just uh, started discussing the draft of law, and I do hope that we will pass this law. Idea that uh, maybe I wrong, but uh, in my understanding, Mangola doesn't need two-digit numbers growth. It's our learning by experience. We experienced two-digit growth, uh, digit number growth, yes, it's fine, but now we understood that uh, maybe it's n there is no need to have a, such a kind of thing. Single-digit number growth, say 7, 8%, 5%, above 5%, wonderful. But whatever goes above this single digit should go to the wealth fund. And this is, should be saved for further generation to our children. And this is, I think, the general idea behind the law which we started discussing. Uh, and uh, I do believe that the current wealth fund will be a very instrumental factor to manage the macro level uh, economy. Of course, we have to look at experience of other countries. Some succeeded really but some failed with these funds. So we will try to avoid the mistakes which other countries did. And, uh, and we do believe it's the most important issue related to this fund, the issue related to the management of this fund and this openness, transparency, uh, citizens' control, revenue watch, and all the things uh, which is related to the mining sector will be very important for, for us. Thank you. Great. Um, oh, hold on one second. <laughs> um, so uh, on this issue of sovereign wealth funds, I'm going to do a little self-promotion. We have a, um, uh, if you just go outside, there's a, uh, a policy brief on uh, sovereign wealth fund governance in resource-rich regions. Uh, we have a whole website dedicated to the topic uh, at resourcegovernance.org slash NRF. So if you're interested in that, please please do visit. I'd also like to remind you that we have a, a blog series on our website uh, on falling prices, rising risks, where we have uh, pieces on both Ghana and Mongolia. Um, and I, so I would invite you to take a look at that too. Uh, but most importantly, I'd like, can we uh, thank our three extremely distinguished panelists for a really fantastic panel this morning. Thank you.